det er nogle af, af, af de af vores medlemmer, der øh, øh, vi skriver øh, leading comp. I'm sorry, I'm speaking uh, Danish, I think. <laughs> I think so too. Very sorry about that. <laughs> Since I come to Finland, I was taught us to speak uh, English, and everybody is speaking Swedish to me and reply in Danish. I'm very, very sorry about that. It was all the marketing, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> very short, we're an organization in Brussels, and we're trying to influence the European uh, politics, and these are some of the leading companies. Uh, and of course, I'm very happy that we have a representative from, uh, from Finland down here in the switch. I had the pleasure to, uh, to dine with, uh, with two of them yesterday. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, I'll go into the presentation now. I'll try and stick to, uh, to, date, sorry, to English. Just to give you an idea about where we are in the industry, because uh, we're always faced with this assertion among the general public and also among uh, journalists. And it's difficult to get journalists also to convey uh, the messages of wind energy. But just to give an idea about uh, how big the industry has actually become, uh, this shows you um, the blue bars, the annual installations in terms of capacity of wind, uh, wind power globally since 2001. The red bars is the other major uh, carbon-free technology, nuclear energy, which of course is, is, is also very relevant here in Finland. And uh, it, I don't have the nuclear figures for 2012 yet, but the wind power figures were up from 41 to about 44 gigawatts at the global level last year. So uh, last year we actually installed more wind power uh, capacity than the world installed nuclear capacity in the last decade. So it's a quite extraordinary uh, technology in that sense. And it does, and I'm sure someone will say, well, the capacity of wind energy does not produce the same amount of electricity as a gigawatt of nuclear energy. And that's absolutely uh, correct. But in terms of employment, in terms of economic activity globally, it's a very, very significant uh, industry. Now, uh, as I said, a gigawatt of wind doesn't produce the same amount of power as a gigawatt of nuclear. So there we've, we've converted the new installations into what they would produce in terms of electricity. And uh, here you also see at a global level that we are, uh, in terms of new installations annually, we, we produce about 80 terawatt hours, that, those annual installations in the last three years, and you can add 2012 as well. Uh, and the red ones is the equivalent for, for nuclear. So in short, if you convert the electricity from all those new uh, wind turbines that are going up globally, uh, we have in the last four years um, been producing the equivalent of 14 to 16 new nuclear reactors, installing them every year. So one nuclear reactor, 1.3 nuclear reactor in electricity terms per month is what we're installing globally uh, in electricity terms. Uh, with this technology. So uh, this assertion that we're very often confronted with that wind is small, uh, and the second one, and I'll come back to that, that wind is expensive, is something that uh, we're struggling with getting uh, across. I think if you go and ask the uh, average man in the street, he would not, or she would not um, believe these figures. But 1.3 nuclear reactors uh, per month globally. And if we take the European figures, we are installing around three to four, in electricity terms again, three to four nuclear reactors per year. So it is a very significant uh, amount of electricity. And with that also comes a great need to integrate that amount of electricity and also develop the power markets and making sure that uh, we can, we can um, feed uh, that amount of electricity into the grids. That's no different from the task we had when we built uh, hydropower plants or when we started building coal-fired power plants uh, or nuclear power plants from the 60s. You need the infrastructure to go with the technology, and that's another very big uh, task. <coughs> this is um, the biggest problem we have in Europe in energy terms is that we're importing uh, a very large uh, part of our energy from abroad. And 
we will be importing even more because our domestic resources are depleting. So certainly from a European perspective and really the perspective of almost any nation of the world, um, we don't have a lot of domestic energy resources in terms of conventional resources. These figures are from the European Commission. Uh, we sit on less than a percent of the world's oil, less than 2% of the world's gas, uh, less than 5% of the world's coal, and then we have 1.9% of the world's uranium, a bit more if you count Greenland as well. But that is uh, the challenge that we have, apart from the climate challenge, of course. Um, we don't have a competitive advantage in conventional fuels, and from our perspective, it does make sense uh, that while these uh, resources, conventional resources, are depleting, uh, and since we don't have um, anything we can export in terms of conventional resources, we develop technology that is newer, that is smarter, and then export that technology and make that be our way of addressing a very uh, serious trade deficit in energy. 700 euros, uh, I think it's gone up a bit since uh, we made these calculations, but that's basically what every man and woman and child in Europe pays for fuel imports every year. So um, every one of you here in this room are sending 700 euros abroad, mainly to uh, the Middle East, to Russia, to pay for the imports to, 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 to meet that 54% of our energy import that comes from abroad. And we believe that it makes more sense to put that amount of money to work in the European economy, develop technology, put it, uh, install the technology, and then export uh, the technology to other countries that most of the world face the same problem. It's only a handful of nations that are, that are uh, fuel exporters. So that makes a lot of sense in Europe and in a lot of other places, and that's why we're also seeing uh, wind energy being um, um, uh, promoted by politicians also increasingly beyond Europe, both in the United States and Canada and uh, Brazil and China, not least, and other places. So we're, we're, wind energy is more starting to become a race of uh, technology leadership, uh, but it's all part of this whole energy battle that, of course, has been going on uh, forever throughout history. Oil and gas imports, uh, our bill, has gone in just three years from 271 billion euros in terms of the imports to 470 billion euros, from 2.1% of our overall GDP to 3.4% of our overall GDP in just three years. I'm not sure that the European consumer feels that uh, he or she gets fantastically better energy services for that 200 billion additional cost that we've actually seen over the last uh, two years. Uh, and of course, um, the problem with being so import dependent is that you actually don't know what your energy bill will be in the future because you have no idea what the cost of those fuels will be. At the same time, um, we have, there's a lot of talk about costs and can wind energy compete, etc. It would be my assertion that with the current fuel uh, costs, and if you're looking at wind energy, compete, new wind parks competing with a new coal-fired power plant, a new gas-fired power plant, or a new nuclear power plant, at the current fuel prices, coal is slightly uh, cheaper in terms of production costs, uh, not least because the shale gas boom in the United States makes the US export a lot of coal into Europe, so the coal price is going down. Coal is slightly cheaper than onshore wind. Gas is slightly more expensive than onshore wind, and nuclear is about uh, twice as expensive as onshore wind if we're talking about building new power plants. But that's about the level where we are. We always get the question, how much longer does wind energy need subsidies? And it's a very difficult question to answer because um, if there were no subsidies, 
if there were no subsidies to wind energy, if there were no subsidies to other renewables, if there were no subsidies to coal, to gas, to nuclear, I believe that onshore wind would be very competitive at the current fuel costs. But everything is tangled up. There is no free market. There is no fair market. There is no level playing field in the energy sector. And that makes it very difficult to answer that question unless you assume that energy is not politically driven and no one receives any subsidies. And the chief economist, Fatih Birol from the International Energy Agency, uh, as he said on the 4th of February in 2000 this year, uh, global fossil fuel subsidies, that doesn't include nuclear subsidies, is 523 billion, or was back in 2011. And they have calculated, the International Energy Agency, that uh, those subsidies are equivalent to 110 uh, dollars per ton of CO2. So, for a CO2 free power uh, technology, uh, that's difficult to compete with. And I think we shouldn't even ask for a level playing field. We should just ask for removing those subsidies. We're not asking for having another 50 or 60 years of subsidies, which has been given to fossil fuels and nuclear. We're just asking that at least remove the subsidies to those technologies that don't need it. And my uh, assertion would be that that would include onshore wind energy in many places if we remove subsidies for all the other technologies. <coughs> That would first of all save governments who have strained budgets, not least in these years, uh, uh, save a lot of money for the governments in, in fossil fuels and nuclear subsidies. It will also reduce the need to introduce, uh, to have subsidies for introducing newer and smarter and cleaner technologies. I would uh, not think it would be reasonable for onshore wind to receive subsidies if it doesn't need it. I would rather have then that you put uh, some support into maybe wind energy at lower wind sites or offshore wind energy, which is still uh, about twice as expensive as onshore wind energy. So what's going on in, in, in Europe when these are basically uh, new power plants built last year uh, in terms of uh, megawatts and what was decommissioned and what you see is that we installed about 11 and a half gigawatts of wind uh, in Europe PV was very, very big, both last year and the year before. Uh, so we actually installed more PV than any other power technology in Europe, mainly in Germany and in Italy, uh, some in Spain as well. And we installed 10.5 gigawatts of new gas power plants, but decommissioned 5.5 gigawatt. We also decommissioned in Europe 5.5 gigawatts of coal, installed 3 gigawatts of new um, coal power plants. And then there are a whole range of, of, of smaller renewable technologies here and um, we took down some of those fuel uh, oil, the oil power plants. They're mainly used in islands but also in some other areas, especially in the south. So they decommissioned 3.2 gigawatts of, of oil uh, electricity capacity last year as well. So that was last year. Um, and if we then look over the change of our power system, what has happened in terms of what have we installed, what have we decommissioned over the, the last uh, decade or a little bit more from 2000 to 2012 and accumulate all these. You'll see that over that uh, period of time we have net installed 121 gigawatts of gas, 97 gigawatts of wind energy and 69 gigawatts of PV. So this is really what we've been building uh, in the last decade or so. And that increase has, of course, covered an increased uh, uh, power consumption in Europe. Uh, but that increase has also been at the expense of uh, coal, nuclear, and fuel oil, where we have decommissioned more over that period than we have installed. This shows you the same. Uh, since 2000, the blue here is new installations of wind energy. The green is PV. So what you can see is that up until 2010, uh, wind energy was uh, by far the largest, in, again, in terms of capacity. This is not electricity. Uh, the, the biggest, and in the, late, in the last three years, and all, uh, PV has come really, really strong. In total last year, about 70% of all new capacity installed in Europe uh, was uh, from renewables. So you do. Um, we're about 20% of our electricity coming from renewables in Europe. 
about 10% of that is, is large hydro. Uh, so the non-large hydro part of this is growing, but it's still only 10% uh, of the electricity generation in Europe. But uh, it's very, very large share in terms of investments, in terms of economic activity, in terms of jobs. And of course, those percentages just go up as, um, as that development happens. And that's what we can see here, that in 2010, we were about, uh, we were about over 20% of our electricity coming from uh, renewables. From a European level, uh, the two most important pieces of legislation we've had was a directive back in 2001, which was only addressing electricity, but which set a target to have 21% of our electricity coming from renewables by 2010. And we can now see that we actually exceeded that target. And then, of course, in 2009, we had the energy and climate package, which gave us the uh, renewables directive, which is not only about electricity, it's also heat and cooling and transport. But in terms of electricity, uh, the idea is that we get more than a third of our electricity coming from renewables by 2020 at the European level. So it's quite a significant growth, also given that slightly less than half of what we already have is large hydro, and that it's difficult to build out large hydro for various reasons. Uh, so, the, so the last has to come from other renewables. This is uh, the total installations uh, what has been what is operating in Europe over that period? We passed 100 gigawatts in September 2012. We're now over 100 gigawatts, and when we did that, uh, we tried to make some calculations on what what does 100 gigawatts of wind power actually produce? Again, to try to illustrate uh, the magnitude of, of of the generation, and that's the reason for this little little photo here. So 100 gigawatts of wind energy would avoid. 72 tons, uh, million tons of carbon dioxide emissions. If, um, if you had to produce the amount of electricity from 100 gigawatts of wind using coal instead, you would need 750,000 of these wagon loads of coal uh, to produce that amount of electricity. And if you took those 750,000 train wagons, they would be 11,500 kilometers long, or the distance from Brussels to Rio de Janeiro. It's a lot of coal that we are, we would, if we removed all the wind and produced it with coal, that's an enormous amount of resources, an enormous resource drain. So it is a very, very significant amount of electricity. But again, 7% of Europe's electricity, which is what we get from wind energy, doesn't sound great. But in, but in terms of volumes and, and what you would have to do alternatively to produce that, it is quite significant. <coughs> These are the annual installations uh, of wind energy. The market last year uh, reached um, almost 12 uh, gigawatts. It was up by 15 or 20%. We haven't communicated that very strongly because uh, it does indicate that everything is going very well in the sector when your market is going by 15 or 20 percent. But of course, megawatts is not necessarily the best statistical method for looking at what, uh, what is going on in the marketplace. These turbines were probably ordered back in 10 or 11, and we have seen and we can see when we look at order books, uh, that the markets, and not least in 2013, is going to be uh, very challenging indeed. I'll come back to, to some of the reasons for that. But it all looks quite neat, uh, but there is uh, certainly a lot of challenges uh, going ahead. These will be very difficult for you to see, but 106,000 uh, megawatts are installed. Finland's up there, I think it's 288, I can't even read that, but I believe it's 288 installed in Finland. And um, of course the, the development in Finland has not happened as fast as in some other countries in Europe. Um, and uh, you know the reasons for that much better than I do. Last year was a relatively very good year for Finnish wind power and, and from what I understand this year is also going to be reasonable and there's certainly a lot of interest and there's a lot of projects in the pipeline and of course it's a bit of frustration for an industry that 
that it, can't, that it doesn't go faster. I would say that when you look at some of the other countries, um, be it Sweden, be it Denmark, or any of the other countries that have developed, what we're seeing is that once, once a, a country reaches about 1,000 uh, megawatts, that can take a long time reaching that 1,000 megawatts because uh, authorities need to get used to how to work, need to get comfortable with the planning procedures, etc., etc. So it can be very, very difficult getting those first hundreds of megawatts. But when we look at some of the other countries, there is some sort of, it's not exactly 1,000 megawatts, but around there, there's uh, interest also in public perception, uh, acceptance, and there is also the structures in place also from the administrative side of things and then things can go extremely fast and I think that's the that's the phase we are in here in Finland there's a very very strong interest uh, there's some rigidity in the system that's no different than from any other country that has developed wind energy in the past and uh, once you get to seven eight hundred it could start to go fast you have uh, about the same amount of people as, as, as Denmark, of course. Uh, they have about, I think, 5,000 turbines installed, but in a very, very small area. And if you're Danish and, and fly from Helsinki to Vasa and look down, <laughs> and you're from the wind energy sector, you're looking down and see that's a lot of potential down there. <laughs> it's also from a space perspective. It's a bit the same with Norway. Uh, they have everything. They have the greatest wind resource in the world, but of course they also have a lot of oil and gas. Um, and it's very difficult to get, to get it built, but uh, I'm sure it will happen there and of course also here in Finland. Um, there you are. This is basically the share of electricity <coughs> consumption uh, from wind energy. The Finnish wind, Associ uh, wind Energy Association may have a different figure because we have another methodology in terms of saying that what's installed, we convert it into um, production in an average wind year. So the actual production might have been different. It's, it's an attempt to try and use the same methodology throughout Europe. But as you see, we're about 7% of our electricity Europe-wide for wind energy. Um, this was 0.5% last year uh, for Finland. So you could say you doubled your amount of electricity, which is definitely an achievement. And you just have to do that a few years, and you'll be all right. Um, then you have countries, of course, as Denmark, in electricity terms, it's not a very big country, uh, but they have significant amounts of, of wind energy and the government also has an ambition um, of increasing that share to 50% by 2020. And then that taps into the, to the other notion that wind energy, we can't have too much on the system, we don't know the lights will go out, etc. And I think Denmark is a very good uh, example on how you can take measures to increase the amount of electricity. Denmark obviously needs uh, very strong um, connections electricity-wise uh, wise to the uh, neighboring countries, not least to the hydropower reserves in, in Norway in order to reach 50% up there. Um, but the Danish TSO, if you go back just 10 years, was saying it will be technically impossible to integrate more than 500 megawatts of wind energy in the Danish system ever, no matter what we do. And again, that's the same development we're seeing in many new countries is, is a lot of rigidity in terms of figuring out how can we actually structure our power system to accommodate this new type uh, of energy. But it can be done and there's a lot of smart people in those transmission system operators. Uh, and um, that's a lot of wind energy in a, in a geographically very small uh, area. And then you have, of course, Portugal, Spain, Ireland, Germany, uh, or Spain and Germany are very big countries, uh, differently from, 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 from Denmark, with significant amounts of wind energy in their systems. In terms of the uh, market shares uh, of new installations last year, it's still Germany uh, in the lead, and followed by the UK, uh, which is new. I think it's the first time ever the UK has been that high. Uh, about half of the UK installations were offshore, <coughs> half of them were onshore, they have very ambitious plans offshore, they still need to send the right investment signals, there's a lot of uncertainty around 
uh, the investment framework in the UK, they are revising their, their electricity market. Italy about 10%, same with Spain. Um, that was a surprise to us. We thought the Spanish market would have all but collapsed in 2012. Uh, they are still building something, but it, in 2011, Germany and Spain together had 50% of new installations, and that is changing. This is a bigger market, as you saw before, so it also means that it, it's more a reflection of other countries growing. Um, and uh, you see also the Eastern European countries coming uh, in strong with Romania and Poland, and then uh, your good neighbor Sweden there also seems to be uh, reaching uh, uh, a very, very comfortable level of, of, of a stable market. A lot of the uh, things that are going on in the energy sector, of course, came out of, of, of Fukushima uh, and the decisions that were made following that. Um, we are in a big debate at European level about where we're going to get our electricity from or energy from in 2050. We have our uh, 2020 targets for, uh, for renewables and our climate targets, but there's also increased recognition that we need longer term um, uh, targets and indications of where we're going. But of course, uh, Fukushima had an enormous amount, enormous impact put on, on, on policy decisions, but also commercial decisions. And this is the EU president, uh, but also was saying um, about renewables in the light of that, that the task for the sector is to prove itself as a scalable, affordable and secure energy source. And I think that's, that's the time we're in now. We need to uh, make sure that we can prove ourselves in that. And of course, Germany um, is, is, if you will, a big test case on how all this is going to happen. Uh, and that's because one of the uh, impacts of Fukushima was that Germany shut down their nuclear reactors. It's going to phase them out. Switzerland um, announced a phase out. It, the Italians had a vote, a referendum, cancelling all plans for new reactors. Siemens pulled out of nuclear energy. Um, President Hollande in France, of all countries, which gets 80% of its electricity from nuclear, um, is talking about at least he backs a, re a reduction uh, to 50%. It's not clear whether that's actually going to happen, but uh, also at the company side, E.ON and RWE has dropped its plans to build reactors in the UK, and RWE has has exited as well uh, from nuclear energy. And of course, one thing is Fukushima, and one thing is about um, the uh, the um, uh, political uh, decisions that are made. But it's also getting increasingly clear that uh, nuclear is extremely expensive. And, and here I'm back to another myth, which is that wind energy is extremely expensive. And of course, it's cheaper to produce electricity from a nuclear power plant or a gas-fired power plant or a coal-fired power plant that has been installed, depreciated, paid off already years ago. But if we talk about new capacity, onshore wind is extremely competitive and certainly, if we're looking at carbon-free electricity in comparison to, to nuclear. EDF was telling investors they have a plan to build a nuclear power plant at Hingley Point. The, the reason I'm not using Finland, the Finnish reactor, as an example is that the price of that keeps changing, so I can't make an analysis on it. But uh, back in 2008, EDF said that it would, it would be around 57 euros per megawatt hour to, it, that would be the, the, the cost of building um, those two reactors. Four years later, that price went up to, well, less than 177 euros per megawatt hour. That's an enormous jump uh, from the same company within just four years. In Brazil, they're doing auctions for new capacity for wind energy, for gas, for hydro mainly, and gas. The contracts that were signed back in 2011 came in at approximately 40 euros per megawatt hour. Personally, I don't believe, they have very good wind resources some places in, in Brazil. Personally, I don't believe that this is, a, uh, this is a benchmark. We can say that this is what you can produce onshore wind uh, with on average everywhere. This is from, a, from contracts from a specific year 
in Brazil with very good sites. But it does give you an idea about these are contracts that are signed at 40 euros per megawatt hour, which is, well, uh, four and a half, well, those cost up here is about four and a half times more expensive than what the actual contracts that were signed in, in Brazil was. And uh, I think it is clear that we have another example from Turkey where I think the winning bid came in at about 100 and 120 uh, euros per megawatt hour in terms of new capacity. And if we're looking at whether there is a business case to be done for wind energy, um, I think fundamentally there is, and certainly when it comes to onshore wind energy, but the perception of the cost of the technology is very, very different. I wouldn't say that this is the benchmark again, but also if you, the, the problem again is that the whole energy sector is, is flushed with subsidies, as I said before, to all kinds of technologies, and that makes it very, very difficult to assess who can compete with whom and how long do we have to provide subsidies to this technology. And the short answer is, if you keep providing subsidies to so-called mature technologies, you're going to have to pay more subsidies to new technologies and for longer. And this is just going to alienate um, um, public acceptance, and it's not a good idea. So we have to somehow get rid of all this, try to start at a clean sheet and say, OK, who can actually compete? And I wouldn't believe that we should put a lot of um, subsidies into building onshore wind energy in Norway if they can get their planning together because the wind, the wind resources there are so good that you can actually uh, compete with energy, anything. In, there's one country in the world that has removed all subsidies, all agricultural subsidies and all energy subsidies and that's New Zealand and wind energy is doing extremely well uh, competitive in terms of competition uh, with the other technologies in, uh, in New Zealand. The other uh, thing that came out last month, I think it was, was from Australia. There were contracts there signed as well, in which wind energy was beating new gas-fired power plants and new coal-fired power plants, which to me is very surprising. If, if onshore wind in Australia can beat coal, Australia is a huge coal country, and you basically dig it right out of the ground and throw it into a power plant, or you build a power plant on top of, of a coal mine, then you have a very, very competitive technology. To give you uh, an example that is not only about uh, what new, new things cost, but uh, in the UK, which has very, very dramatic plans also for nuclear, um, and these, are, these figures are from a speech that the, um, that the energy min or the former energy minister made. These are the decommissioning funds for the 16 existing nuclear reactors. And those reactors produce 16% of the UK's electricity. These are the decommissioning funds that the taxpayers, that the government has levied on taxpayers, put in, in a fund to decommission the existing power plants. Now, there's not a lot of nuclear reactors that has been built in this period, because they were built down here or even before. But the assessment of, of, of how much it will cost to the commission this keeps growing and growing and growing, even though the number of reactors don't grow. And that's, of course, also a cost. And we did a thought experiment because we did some input into the electricity market reform in the UK. And said so these 53 uh, billion pounds, which are taxpayers' money sitting in a fund for future decommissioning, uh, of nuclear power plant that produces 60% of the UK's electricity. Thought experiment, if you had that amount of money, how much wind energy could you actually get for 53 billion, um, which is just the money in those decommissioning funds? You'd be able to get about 55 gigawatts of onshore wind, I'm excluding offshore, producing 140 terawatt hours or 41%. So the decommissioning funds that are sitting paid for by the taxpayers to decommission 16 ex existing nuclear power plants, uh, producing 16% of the UK's uh, power production. That money, if you invested it in new onshore wind energy, would cover 41% of the UK's power production. It's a staggering amount. Um, we made the calculation based on three megawatt machines. It would require about 18,000 turbines. And then the other element in terms of uh, there's not space enough, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That would require about 1.6% of the UK landmass uh, 
to meet those 40%. To get back to whether there is a, a business case or if there is a, 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 the future outlook for wind energy in Europe, uh, the European Commission came out with some scenarios uh, back in December 2011. It was based on their energy model and it looked at, it took as a, as a, as a base that uh, the heads of states, the 27 heads of states of Europe has said we need to reduce our carbon emissions by 80 to 95 percent economy-wide. And what that means is that for the electricity sector, you will need to remove carbon completely because you would still need some carbon emissions for transport and for agriculture. They're very difficult to completely remove. In that setup, uh, how much new capacity would be built? And that's an economic optimization model. And basically what the commission is saying is that we need 356 gigawatts in this decade. And they believe that renewables will be 60 plus 11 percent, so 71 percent, um, 25 percent will be fossil fuels and 3 percent will be nuclear, and in the next decade about 77 percent of all new installations would have to be uh, from renewables, 13 percent uh, nuclear, 37 percent, uh, sorry, 10 percent, 13 nuclear, 10 percent fossil fuels. Those were the commission figures. We, uh, in terms of our scenarios, believe that in this decade uh, about 200 billion will be invested in wind energy. That would take us from the current 106 gigawatt to about 230 gigawatts of total installed capacity. Um, and uh, if we get there, wind energy would produce about 15, 16 percent of Europe's electricity needs a bit depending on how, how demand develops. And in the next decade, um, we believe about 250 billion will be uh, invested. Offshore would, uh, would uh, increase um, as a share of total over that period. Um, to get back to what I have said and in terms of what are the political drivers uh, in those whole, this whole energy uh, uh, policy debate that goes on in Brussels is that uh, the heads of states have committed to this 80 to 95 percent reduction uh, in carbon emissions economy-wide. And it then followed up and looked at for the power sector, what does that mean? It means that by 2050, we have to reduce our emissions by 93 to 99 percent. So almost have no carbon emissions by 2050. We have then tried to uh, remind those heads of states, this is what heads of states do. They, they, they can't agree on, an, on a shorter term uh, direction in the form of 2030 targets. So they go out and make a 2050 uh, commitment because that commitment will have to be justified by other politicians because they'll no longer be there uh, to be held responsible. And what we're trying to do is to say, well, you have 27 heads of states and also the G8, uh, by the way, saying that these are the carbon emission reduction targets. For the electricity sector, that means you can't emit carbon in 2050. If you are true to that commitment, you cannot build a carbon emitting power plant starting today. Because if you build a new coal-fired power plant, it's going to be around 40 years from now. Gas-fired power plant, maybe only 30 or 35 years uh, lifetime on that. But either you're true to that commitment or you admit that this is just something we're saying because it's so far into the future that no, one, no, no voter is going to hold us responsible for it. It's probably the latter, <laughs> that's the case, but still it's, it, that's the reality we're trying to, to convey is and our, our policy advice, uh, the simple policy advice to the heads of state on that one was, well, if you're true to this, ban carbon in all new power plants and let the technologies that can produce electricity without carbon compete and see who's best. And I am absolutely convinced, certainly, onshore wind would do extremely well in that, in that debate. And then perhaps we would need a bit of support to develop our offshore wind in that time. Of course, that was a bit too simple. That's a bit too simple for the Commission to propose. Um, so we had another proposal, which was if you don't want to ban carbon, then put an um, emissions performance standard 
uh, in and say all new power plants can emit a maximum of 350 grams of CO2 uh, per kilowatt hour, and then you reduce that over time, uh, and that 350 is basically a, a modern uh, gas-fired uh, power plant. Uh, and then you reduce it over time, just as you do with car emissions. You have a legislation saying car emissions has to fall over time. And that would be the second best option. And of course, the third best option would be to have some sort of target or indication of a renewables target for 2030. So that's a debate that's going on right now and we're spending a lot of time on. And uh, we'll see where that lands. Um, and that's all based on this modeling exercise that the European Commission did with this energy roadmap for 2050. What it says, what in, in all their scenarios, they had five different scenarios. They said that renewables would have to be between 55 and 75% by 2050. And for wind, in terms of electricity, in all those scenarios, including the business as usual scenario, in the business as usual scenario, which doesn't meet the 80% reduction, the commission has 32% wind in 2050. Uh, in some of the other scenarios, it has up to 50% almost. And what we're, uh, what we're saying is that in terms of, of 2020, it's a quite short time away. You, you, have the carbon, uh, you have the carbon commitments. You also have a European power sector, renewables or not. The whole electricity sector does not know what to invest in. If you talk to the large power companies, they'll say, well, we can't, we can't invest in, in, um, in gas because we can't operate it for enough hours a year, and we don't know the fuel cost. We can't invest in nuclear because we're either not allowed or it's too expensive, and we can't invest in, um, in coal because of carbon emissions, and we don't know what's going to happen to the emissions trading scheme. Um, so for the whole electricity, there's an enormous amount of, of uncertainty out there. Also, and of course, you have 2020 targets for renewables that puts a bit of a, of a cushion under this. But um, if this is the long-term goal, we need some sort of indication that goes way beyond 2020. 2020 is tomorrow, and it's not only about generation. It's also about the infrastructure. And if no one provides an indication about what kind of technology, or at least what kind of carbon level would we have to be at in 2030, it's very difficult to figure out how to um, design your infrastructure, because the infrastructure needs to have some element uh, of certainty as to what kind of technologies are we going to be putting into that infrastructure. We, of course, believe that uh, in a time of economic distress, ending fossil fuels and nuclear subsidies, well, globally, but definitely in Europe, would be a very, very smart thing for, for governments that are budget constrained to do. It makes no sense. Uh, to increase, to, to continue those subsidies, uh, and it also makes it unnecessarily expensive to support new technologies, including wind energy. So that is, should be a quite simple uh, exercise. Of course, the difficult part of, especially the fossil fuel subsidies, is related to fuel poverty, that um, we don't want uh, the, um, the people in our societies that have less to have a very large share of their, because it's a basic, electricity is a basic need, and therefore a lot of these subsidies are in, in the form of making sure that people who don't have the means can actually afford electricity. But there are other ways of doing that than direct subsidies to uh, fossil fuels. That can be done through other legislation. I'm not going to talk most, much about the emissions trading scheme. I think I can talk about that for. Uh, another hour if you want me to. If there are any questions later, I'll tell you. Uh, there's a lot of debate right now on the emissions trading scheme, whether it's working. Some of you know um, the carbon price is practically zero, which means it's free to pollute. Uh, it's still free to pollute, I should say, after having had a period where you were actually subsidized to pollute um, in accordance with this emissions trading scheme. Um, and the Commission is now trying to, I wouldn't even say solve it, there's a lot of discussion on what is called backloading, which is basically taking some emission allowances out of the system now and put them back in a couple of years later. That's not going to solve uh, or cure this patient. Um, but you might, it might buy you time 
to make more structural changes to the emissions trading scheme, and that's desperately needed because that's well, that's a patient that should go to the hospital very soon, and unless they they get it fixed, something else has to be in place. And then, of course, we need physical infrastructure and a single EU market for electricity. This this single market we have been promoting for well many years, and. Um, I think it was in 1986, the European Union um, passed the Single European Act, which basically gave us the free movement of goods, services, capital and labor throughout Europe. We still don't have free movement of electricity around Europe, and if we don't have that, we can't really say that we have an internal market. An internal market and the free movement of electricity throughout that market is extremely important for wind energy. For, for two main reasons. One is, from a technology perspective, the larger the, com the, the system is, the more you can level out the variability of the wind. So from a technology perspective, of course we have a, an inherent interest in creating a large, well interconnected uh, power system. And for that we need physical infrastructure. That physical infrastructure is also needed to to make sure the competition is optimal within that market. And again, I can stand here and tell you that onshore wind is largely competitive with new gas and new coal. I can't prove it until that market works, because at the moment uh, energy is, 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 is national. Uh, we have 27 uh, different uh, market rules uh, in those countries, and with the uh, austerity that we're having, we're also seeing that member states are actually starting to nationalize their energy policies as well, which also has to do with the fact that there, there is not yet any direction on what's going to happen after 2020. So we're actually having different member states putting different energy policies in place that reaches far beyond 2020 and, and which most likely will um, not be compatible with whatever we want to do after 2020. So there is, in terms of time, a need to send a direction for what's going to happen after 2020. On economic terms, our uh, competitive position and uh, uh, gives you an idea about whether there will be a business uh, also in Europe for this. Of course, what, what defines that is what, what does fuel cost? There's a lot of talk about shale gas, its impact, uh, it certainly had a very big impact in the United States in terms of lower gas prices. Um, it also has an impact right now in Europe because that abundance of gas in the United States makes the United States export a lot of coal into Europe and that makes, means that the coal uh, fuel costs are going down, which again means that in fact uh, If you're looking at new investments, coal is favored over gas uh, in Europe because of those lower fuel costs. So you have a very, very bizarre situation in which the European Union has an emissions trading scheme and targets for reducing CO2 emissions and gas is thrown out of the system because it can't compete with coal. And then you have the United States, which doesn't have a carbon instrument where uh, basically um, gas is thrown coal out of it. So it's a bit, it's a bit uh, ironic, but that will be a huge determinant of, of where we will be in terms of competition. Cost of emitting CO2, it's currently free, almost, in Europe. Of course, a global carbon price would be the best. Uh, let's fix at home first, and then see if we can expand that. And then our competitive uh, situation will be to a large extent determined on a, whether we have these well-functioning markets. Um, and I've said it a few times, I do believe that if you had a thought experiment where, where you didn't have all these subsidies and where you didn't have all these special favors, um, I'll give you one example. Uh, it's just one out of a hundred thousand. I was in Norway a couple of weeks ago and what the Norwegian Wind Energy Association is trying to push legislatively is that they get the same depreciation rules as oil and gas rigs in the North Sea. Apparently, according to the accounting rules in, uh, in Norway, you can depreciate um, 
you depreciate a, um, an onshore wind uh, turbine over 21 years, you can depreciate an oil and gas rig in the North Sea in four. It's just one example of a measure where the Norwegians in this case are just saying, well, just treat us in the same way, uh, or at least make, make, make some sort of logic into this, because of course, there's no logic in saying that you have to depreciate an onshore wind farm uh, five times longer than a, an oil rig in the North Sea. Infrastructure is critical, and overall, uh, which goes together with whether the market is functioning is, uh, or not, um, our competitive advances will be determined on whether uh, those who are going to invest in new power production capacity are actually exposed to the fuel price risk and the carbon price risk. If, if competition is not effective and I'm a power producer, if I can pass over the risk of, let's say, uh, gas prices doubling to my consumers because I won't lose any market share, then then it's not good for wind energy. The, the, they have, the investors have to be exposed to the fuel price risk and the carbon price risk, and that requires that the markets are working, and they definitely are not at the moment. And then, lately, access to and, and the cost of capital is a big issue. Um, it's a lot of investments, and I was showing it before, about, about 200 billion euros of investments this decade, and that requires, obviously, a lot of capital. As a result of the financial crisis, you now see a lot of regulation being put on banks, and they have historically provided a lot of the, of the funding for, uh, for wind energy investments. And uh, what the outcome of the financial crisis is that those banks are, first of all, increasing their risk premiums, so they can pick up money at the central banks at almost zero interest rate. But in order to invest it in projects, it costs 10% once it reaches the market because they're very busy on strengthening their balance sheet as a result of all these new capital requirements. Now, there's tons of money out there, not in the banks, but in, for instance, pension funds and in insurance companies. Um, but it's, it's a very time uh, consuming effort to try to get a large pension fund who has long-term liabilities, which fits quite well with our long-term assets. From, from, from a pension fund's perspective, wind energy investments is like real estate. It's a long-term asset, it's relatively stable, and, and that's good. But getting a pension fund manager to allocate just 5% of his total assets into uh, wind energy investments, it takes a long time. But that is something we are working on uh, in the European Wind Energy Association. But it is, it is a constraint. <laughs> so in conclusion, yes, yeah. And I think I'll maybe just start, uh, just, just close with the, with the first point there. Uh, the market conditions for wind energy investments have changed fundamentally. And just to give you one idea, we have 75 gigawatts of total uh, production capacity in the world and the market is about 44 gigawatts. And this, of course, means that there are a lot of uh, manufacturers, not least, but also sub-suppliers, that are struggling uh, these days until we get to a, more bal a better balance between supply and demand. If you ordered a, a wind turbine two years ago, or three years ago, uh, you would be asked to pay, first of all, a much higher price than you do today, and you would be asked to put 30% uh, of your investment up front, and, um, the delivery time would be two years. That has completely changed, and of course, uh, that does uh, challenge us in the years ahead, and that'll be the case in, in Europe as well as in, in other places around the world. Thank you very much for listening.